inspire us and guide us. Today, we also fondly remember late Dr. Veena Sharma, who put up a brave fight against cancer, but eventually succumbed to it. Dr. Sharma was a researcher who worked at India's premier Central Drug Research Institute. She was also a noted educationist and spearheaded campaigns against tobacco, which is one of the major risk factors for cancers, as we know. I invite her daughter, Dr. Visme Sharma, who is a public health expert, to dedicate this webinar to the memory of her mother, Dr. Veena Sharma. Over to you, Dr. Visme. Thank you, Banan. Good evening, everyone. Before we start today's World Cancer Day webinar, today, as we start today's World Cancer Day webinar, I would like to share briefly and pay tribute to my mother, late Dr. Veena Sharma, in whose memory this webinar is dedicated. Dr. Veena Sharma was born and brought up in UP, India. She was a lady with peerless values, a spark that has been a sample of impregnability, which was so remarkable in her lifetime. She researched a new technique of chemotherapy and chemoprophylaxis in experimental leishmaniasis during her tenure at Central Drug Research Institute, which was very well documented as well in several journals. Along with that, her contribution as noted educationist has unfurled the, the sale of many lives. Her involvement in tobacco control activities as well has positively affected the youngsters and the teenagers. Her tenacious willpower and determination was her strength and that has helped her and her family to fight against her battle for cancer. So I um, dedicate this webinar to all the cancer survivors and all the people who have lost their lives for cancer. Over to you, Shubha ma'am. Thank you, Banan. Thank you, Dr. Visma Sharma. Uh, as we know, World Cancer Day is observed every year on the 4th of February, and this has been happening since 1993. Uh, and this uh, is observed to raise awareness amongst people about cancer and to help reduce its incidence and deaths due to cancer as well. And uh, the theme for World Cancer Day 2020 is I am, I will. As we all know, 193 countries have promised to avert untimely deaths due to cancer and other non-communicable diseases by one-third by 2030. But with less than 132 months left to meet these targets, it is alarming to note that instead of declining, several cancers are on the rise in many parts of the world. Today, we have a distinguished panel of experts to help us understand better on how we can deliver on the global goals and targets, which are not only critical to address non-communicable diseases, but also to speed up progress on other SDGs, that is other sustainable development goals. Before I hand over the mic to our guest moderator, I would like to make a few quick housekeeping announcements. All participants, please keep yourself muted during the course of the webinar and also your video is switched off. Uh, you must be seeing a microphone and video button on your screens. While the panelists are speaking, participants, please mute yourself and turn the videos off. Panelists, please make sure that you are uh, unmuted before you speak. Uh, and, uh, and also, you may mute yourself while some other panelist is speaking. Uh, I request the participants to keep sending their questions and comments even as panelists present uh, and not wait till the end. Uh, you can click on the chat box which must be there on your screen and then type in your question or, your, or comment. If you wish to speak, then please click on the virtual hand you see on your screen once the open session begins. I now welcome our guest moderator for today, Ashok Ramsuru, who is a widely acclaimed award-winning journalist from South Africa, Durban. Uh, he was a senior producer at South African Broadcasting Corporation. Over to you, Ashok. Warm greetings from the port city of Durban in South Africa. According to the latest global cancer data, 
by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, there have been an estimated 18.1 million new cancer cases diagnosed in 2018. 9.6 million cancer-related deaths were also reported. Lung and breast cancers are the most common cancers worldwide with an incidence of 11.6% each respectively. Lung cancer is also the leading cause of cancer deaths globally and its prevalence is rising among women, surpassing breast cancers in 28 countries. The 28 data also suggest that countries with a high human development index or HDI have about three times higher cancer incidence than those with low or medium HDI. We will be hearing shortly from our experts in the field of medicine. We are indeed honored to have with us an imminent panel of speakers. Among our panelists are Ms. Tuvi Cook Milan, World Cancer Day Campaign Manager at the Union for International Cancer Control, UICC. Dr. Natia Tripuridet, lung cancer expert and postdoctoral fellow, I can School of Medicine in I, USA. He is also a faculty at HRH Princess Chulabon College of Medical Science, Thailand, and is principal investigator of Integrative Lung Cancer Screening Project for Thailand. Dr. Pooja Ramakant, breast cancer specialist from India. Dr. Ramakant is additional professor, Department of Endocrine Surgery, King George's Medical University, KGMU, and vice dean of innovation and intellectual property cell, KGMU. And not forgetting Dr. Tarak Singh Bam, Deputy Regional Director, Asia Pacific Region at the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the Union and Secretariat of APCAT, Asia Pacific Cities Aliens for Tobacco Control and NCDs Prevention, Singapore. I now hand over to our Citizen News Service Executive Director and Managing Editor, Shobha Shukla, Madam. Uh, thank you, Ashok, thank you very much. Uh, I'm indeed thrilled to note that three of our panelists are women today. Hats off to all of us. Uh, I now invite our first panelist to Cook Billon. And please forgive me if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Uh, she is World Cancer Day Campaign Manager at the Union for International Cancer Control, or UICC, as we more commonly know it. UICC leads the global fight against cancer, and it is also the official organizer of World Cancer Day every year. Two, please share with us some highlights of this year's World Cancer Day campaign. Over to you, Thu. I think Thu has not come as yet. She hasn't logged in. Sorry for that. So uh, uh, we welcome our next speaker, Dr. Nathya uh, Tripuridet, who is faculty at HRH Princess Chulabon College of Medical Sciences, Bangkok. And she's principal investigator for Thailand for Asia's Integrative Lung Cancer Screening Project. Uh, she's also a postdoctoral fellow at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, USA. Uh, Dr. Nathya, can you please share some findings of this lung cancer screening project and how they can help in lung cancer care and control? Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths uh, globally. Hi. Yes, Dr. Nathya. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good morning from New York. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you, the organizing committee, for giving me the opportunity to have a talk today. Okay, I guess... Okay, um, first of all, 
first of all, I would. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you okay. clearly. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm gonna start with nodal CT screening for lung cancer study in Asia. From systematic review, 25 studies from six countries were identified, including Japan, China, mainland, Taiwan, Israel, Korea, India, and Thailand. These studies uh, enrolled. Uh, uh, Natea, can I interrupt? Can you share your screen, please? We cannot uh, uh, see your screen. Can you please share your screen? I, okay. Can you see? Yes, 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 we can see now. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. So uh, the this study enrolled various asymptomatic participants, most of them include smoker and never smoker, and the other include high-risk smoker, having family history of lung cancer, having at least one of the following risks, current or former smoker, passive smokers, occupational exposure, cooking foam exposure, family history of cancer and history of pulmonary TB or COPD, the baseline lung cancer detection rate range from 0.2% to 2.8%. The high rate more than 1% were observed in individuals with indoor air pollution exposure in China, Shunwei Center, as high as 2.9%. And in participants with family history of lung cancer, 1.7%. And in smoker, 1.4%. The lung cancer detection rates for our of study range from 0.2 to 2.3%. The high rate were observed in studies that included multiple risk criteria as high as 1.6% and 2.3%. Now I'm going to move on how to reduce lung cancer death. First of all, the uh, prevention is uh, the most important avoid a lower risk of lung cancer by do not smoke, avoid other risk factors such as HIV infection, environmental risk factors, secondhand smoke, air pollution, air place exposure, air radiation exposure, and avoid beta carotene supplement in heavy smokers. Implement effective tobacco control and smoking cessation policy and raise awareness of environment risk and implement control policy. Secondly, early detection of lung cancer by low CT screening in asymptomatic heavy smoker that are proven that decrease lung cancer death and all cause death. From an LST study in 2011 show that three rounds of annual CT screening compared to chest X-ray in high risk in heavy smoker more than 30 pack year can decrease 20% lung cancer death. And just last year, multi centric Italian lung detection showed that annual and biennial CT, lodo CT screening compared to control in heavy smoker more than 20 pack year with longer screening duration with median duration of six years. Uh, decreased lung cancer death 39%. Lodo CT screening also decreased our cause death 7% in NLST study and 20% in mild try. However, in this try, the 95% uh, CI include one, so no statistical significant. Lodo CT screening can detect lung cancer, COPD, ischemic heart disease, that known as big three diseases. Moreover, can detect 
other chronic lung diseases such as tuberculosis, bronchitis, and interstitial lung disease that are, are, were in the uh, a top 10 causes of death worldwide. Thus, lotto CT screening may be an opportunity to uncover a large proportion of patients with underdiagnosed ischemic heart disease, COPD, and other chronic diseases and may have an impact on their long-term outcome. Thirdly, get timely diagnosis and appropriate treatments for lung cancer. There are so many barriers, such as in misinterpret as symptoms, as typical smoking-related diseases other than lung cancer. Stigma, that self-blame, guilt, and shame of uh, smokers, misperception that lung cancer is a death sentence and treatment for lung cancer, what food try. Cultural barriers. Some patients prefer traditional medicine over conventional medicines. High cost of lung cancer treatment and care also a barrier. And healthcare system context misdiagnosed as primary TB, particularly in the endemic area of tuberculosis, just as in Thailand. Insufficient resources and limited healthcare infrastructure, insulting in limited access to standard diagnosis, molecular testing, and novel treatment. Strategy to improve outcome, such as raising awareness of the alarming symptoms of lung cancer. Patient education on lung cancer and treatment benefits. Removing the brain and stigma associated with lung cancer. And required government healthcare agency and the community to take care, to take an integrated approach to balancing health policy, treatment priority, and social value. I got to end up with take home messages. In Asia, low dose CT screening for lung cancer could yield high lung cancer detection rates, not only in smokers, but also in never smokers with other risk factors. Low dose CT screening in high risk smokers decreases all cause and lung cancer mortality. Increased benefits seen in more rounds of screening. To improve lung cancer survival, barriers to lung cancer, to early lung cancer diagnosis and treatment need to be addressed and managed. Improving tobacco control and smoking cessation policies remain the most important national priorities to reducing the burden of lung cancer and other smoking related diseases together with awareness of smoking and environmental risk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nathya. Our next speaker is noted. Yeah, thank you. Our next speaker is noted breast cancer specialist from India, Dr. Pooja Ramakan. She is additional professor, Department of Endocrine Surgery at King George's Medical University, and 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 very and an expert in her field. Dr. Ramakant, what can countries like India do better to prevent and control breast cancer, which is the most common cancer globally? And what are the major major bottlenecks we are facing in bringing down its incidence? It is quite high at 11.6% as uh, Ashok Ramsarup had mentioned earlier. Hello, okay. Shubha Madam. I hope I am audible to everybody. Yes, very audible. Yes. Sure. So are you able to see my presentation? Uh, we can uh, see your, yes, you please uh, share your screen. Yes, we can, we can see you now. Can we can't see, see your screen. But my presentation? Not yet. Okay. Now can you see? Yes, yes. We sure. can see it now. So yeah, you raised a very pertinent issue that uh, what are the two important things that uh, what we can do for prevention for breast cancer and how can we control it and what are the major bottlenecks we face? 
why we are not able to bring down the incidence so if you see icmr has written recently a beautiful statement that cancer is a war that can be won if you know what to look for so if we have to stop and win this war we have to understand what causes cancer how can we prevent it what are the symptoms to look for sad part is right now in india every two women who are newly diagnosed with breast cancer one woman dies because of it in 2018 162000 new cases were diagnosed out of that 87000 women died that is the paradox and sad part which we have and we need to work on it if you see are we on track on reducing the more orange or reddish we become the more incidence goes higher up so you can see in 1990 it was not that orange now india has become majority part has turned orange or reddish so that shows that the incidence is increasing and not decreasing so this is a burden other change which we have if you see red is at present scenario and blue is 25 years back if you see the blue lines bars were higher in elderly women 50 years plus so that shows that breast cancer was happening in women who were 50 plus but if you see the red pattern now that is gradually shifting towards the younger side so now women are getting more cancers in their 30s 40s and even in 20s that is really really alarming and we have no so answer to that why that trend has happened and uh, in young women the cancer behaves more aggressively also if you see compared to the western literature in abroad us women get more cancers in 50s and 60s and that too they get in c2 the early stages of cancer so that is why their death rates are much low as compared to the incidence now coming what are the risk what can cause breast cancer there are certain modifiable factors and certain which are not modifiable at least what are modifiable we should be working on it to modify as we grow older the as the age increases the risk of getting cancer or any disease increases so age per se is a risk factor then early menarche having menstrual cycles at the earlier than 10 years of age and late menopause after 60 years of age that increases the estrogenic drive and estrogen hormone is prone to cause or promote cancers breast cancer cells to grow women who are nulli paras who have not given childbirth or they have late uh, childbirth after 30 years of age then the risk increases then obesity sedentary lifestyle not lack of exercise that causes cancer cells to grow alcohol also in any amount is now has been shown by studies that it causes cancer cells to grow earlier there was a particular amount now even they say any amount is risky then any radiation to chest wall causes risk for cancers only 5 to 10% are hereditary or 20 to 30% are familial so that means 90% cancers are not genetic and they are environmental induced any women who take ocps or any hormone replacement therapy have a slight risk not a very high risk but there is a slight risk then now more and more focus is happening on chemicals pesticides the chemicals in the food coloring agents the pollutants in the environment that is causing more cancer cells and people are studying a lot one of the examples recently i read is about the hair dye and the chemical straighteners this is just one of the examples we don't know what all chemicals even in the cosmetics we are using the food pesticides we are e eating or drinking in the water the contaminants even in the environment everything is causing cancer cells to grow other part is that in india we see women presenting in stage 2 and stage 3 cancers in the advanced stages they don't come early to us so problem is not bottleneck is not getting they know they have a problem in their body but they don't approach to a doctor directly the bottleneck is there so the problems are late stage of presentation women are not aware about the cancer treatment they come late so that adds to the cost of the treatment because of advanced stage the survival rates are much less and because they present in advanced stage there are lot of chemotherapies and uh, treatment becomes more complicated so because of that complex treatment lot of complications happen and some women they die because of the 
treatment related complications and not per se they die because of the disease and the last is that we have very heterogeneous healthcare system it is not uniform so if a woman wants to come to a doctor they may not have the healthcare facilities available nearby to their home and they may hesitate or they may have financial crux or they may have social stigma or there are so many other factors women health per se is not that much given importance in a family which they ignore a lot there are many other social parameters also which adds to this burden so how can we pick up cancers in the early stage we have to educate women about breast self examination they have to be aware about breast cancer and uh, its treatments and they can do self examination monthly and clinical examination by a doctor once in 6 months which is useful in countries like india where mammography or any imaging involves a lot of cost so women should know that any lump any change in the skin any lymph nodes palpable any discharge from nipple all that are signs of cancer earlier the whole breast used to get removed but now as the treatment has advanced we can conserve the breast and remove only the lump or only the lymph node which stains blue with the dye so the whole treatment involves surgery chemotherapy radiation hormonal all this shrinks narrows down if the women presents in the earlier stage so they can have cosmetically aesthetically and oncologically safe breast if they present early so all this information has to be passed on there are lot of risk assessment models which are freely available on google which they can be aware of like one of the example i'm giving is gale model they ask simple questions at what age did you what is your particular age when did you start having menstrual cycles is anybody in your family having breast cancer or not previously did you had any breast biopsy yes or no you fill this simple questionnaire it takes 2 3 minutes and you get your own score how much you are at risk of getting a cancer if the risk is higher you may have a regular checkup with a doctor periodically so self examination means that they examine in while taking shower while standing position seeing both the nipples are at same level there is no distortion in the breast and examining the breast clockwise direction on lying down also and seeing there is no nipple discharge so this can be done every month so that any change happens quickly the women can report to a doctor this does not involve any cost is very simple is easily available on google they can anybody can download it no special equipments are needed no trained personnel is needed just once they learn and they can do it the diagnostic power of self examination is up to 80 to 90% and it can reduce mortality up to 50% so it is quite useful and simple if they are not confident in getting them them own examine they can come to a doctor and have a clinical examination by a doctor once in 6 months at least when they are 30 years or 40 years of age and above so the doctor can examine it if they can afford they can have a mammogram after 40 years of age once in 2 years or after 50 years every year in india government has initiated one screening program which is very strategic and systematic that the hospital the peripheral health center doctors will first examine the women do the screening and the nursing staff and the paramedical staff will help them and if they pick up any problems any lumps then they will image only those women so all the women will not have mammography screening but they will be examined by a doctor so that way we are trying slowly to seep in and permeate in the population and create some awareness so what can we do to spread awareness we can talk about it like right now we are doing we can write articles on it we can have role plays patients are the best uh, awareness uh, modalities because a lady who has undergone any problem treatment for breast cancer she is the best person to support other women who is going to start her journey with cancer so we have also created a breast cancer support group and women are helping each other to fight this war we can have awareness programs lot of billboards advertisements we can educate school children and college students so that they act as torch bearers to create awareness we can collaborate with many people who can help us in this path so we have done lot of awareness programs and october is a breast cancer awareness month where we again do it so we can do it whenever we want and whatever whenever it is possible so i think i end by saying that knowing it exists is just not enough we have to be informed ourselves first and we have to pass it on this information to others so that everybody is aware we have to stay healthy we eat healthy food we don't eat any preservatives or any carbohydrate 
sugary rich foods which cause cancer aggravate cancer cells to grow we need to exercise regularly that also reduces cancer incidence and examine the breast every month have knowledge about breast cancer and no don't be scared or ignorant about it the moment you feel any change in your body it is good to report to a doctor and get examined so with this i thank you all and happy to answer any questions thank you very much pooja so the key is that uh, the health seeking behavior of women needs to improve and as you rightly said it is early diagnosis which is crucial uh, moreover as we know it's a uh, Uh, breast cancer does not affect only women but men too although perhaps uh, the cases are less documented less frequent but men too suffer from breast cancer uh, yes. i yes i now invite dr tara singh bam deputy regional director of the asia pacific region at the international union against tuberculosis and lung disease and a noted tobacco control expert Uh, Dr. Baum, uh, what is the connect between tobacco and cancer, and how can local action for tobacco control impact reduction in cancer-related deaths? You are a great one. You have spearheaded a big movement for local action. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Sova, for organizing this. Uh, uh, the webinar i think this is a, a really timely and we can share our uh, the you know the uh, now the campaign uh, on prevention of the cancer and also other uh, ncds uh, i i fully agree that uh, the you know with the previous speakers uh, they have uh, rightly connected the uh, the the association between tobacco use and the cancer and other ncds Uh, i can say here the tobacco use is one of the leading cause of the cancer and uh, yes you all know tobacco kills more than 7 million people each year uh, at the global level and the, the the death rates are increasing in low and middle income countries uh, so uh, the uh, uh, i'm not going to detail about the the association between tobacco and cancer is already well established Uh, but i would like to just say highlight here is there is no any safe level of tobacco use even people who are, who, who use any type of tobacco products uh, uh, we can say that they are also all the time in the risk to get any uh, any type of disease especially the cancer uh, so uh, uh, as i mentioned earlier the uh, uh, how the yeah, we can save the the millions of lives from you know the the no ncds and uh, also from the tobacco use uh, we have to uh, have uh, some very specific uh, the the strategy as for the country settings uh, the the local settings uh, if the, the strategy can be different from country to country from region to region from city to city so there are there are some best uh, best buys that uh, the uh, those uh, uh, best buys have been recommended by the uh, world health organization and the many the global the public health the the, uh, uh, the the leaders and organizations for tobacco control so the uh, one of them is uh, the most uh, the, the effective uh, strategy is uh, taxation on the tobacco products so that uh, if we, if we raise the tax on tobacco products i, I think that would really help to uh, to uh, to prevent the, the new initiation of tobacco use and also that would also help to promote the the uh, uh, the quit among the the people who currently use uh, their tobacco so uh, so it's a uh, there, there are several the evidence that we have as per the the uh, old bank suggests that so if we increase if, if if some country increase a tax with a 10% and there is a, the uh, 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 and all it can really contribute to save the 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 uh, uh, save the uh, the people's so lives uh, and also we can say the you know the uh, as per the the old bank recommendation the country has to increase the tax or more than 70% that would really prevent the, the millions of death from the the cancer and also from the non communicable disease 
So the other strategy that I would say here is a ban all types of tobacco advertising, promotion and sponsorship. That is also we need to really uh, the, uh, prevent the exposure to the, uh, the tobacco advertising. Uh, so the, the countries and cities uh, uh, needs to really make a comprehensive ban by implementing uh, a strong tobacco control. The third strategy in tobacco control is uh, creating uh, tobacco-free uh, the environments, especially the, the nobody should be exposed to any uh, to secondhand smoke or uh, to other smoke because the, the as I mentioned earlier the, there is no any safe level. So it, it's a relatively the, a very easy strategy to implement. The what we need we need the uh, uh, the government's commitments, the stakeholders' engagement, the media engagement and the, the action on the ground. Uh, the, the fourth, the other uh, strategy, I would say like uh, the cessation. Uh, I, I think this is uh, the, uh, we should commit ourselves and everybody has to make a commitment to help the, the tobacco user to quit smoking. Quitting uh, the smoking is one of the key strategy to, uh, to prevent the, the, the cancer, especially the lung cancer. So uh, the, how can we make it happen? I think we need to, uh, uh, in any public health uh, the intervention, political commitment is a key uh, the strategy. Uh, so we, we need uh, also for tobacco control and also prevention of non-communicable disease, we need a political commitment, both at national and sub-national level. Uh, uh, as the uh, union, the initiative, you know, to establish uh, uh, cities alliance in Asia Pacific for the mayors and the, the uh, political leaders. Uh, we established this week, so we call the APCAT in 2016 with the aim to, uh, uh, to introduce uh, uh, effective public health strategy, especially at the NCDs and the uh, tobacco control. Uh, we started with the, uh, the 12 cities from the eight countries. Now it has been uh, the expanded to 65 cities uh, and district in, uh, uh, in 12 countries in Asia Pacific. So we, we can see the, uh, you know, the, the commitment of the local leaders to really make a difference by implementing the different public health programs, the strong tobacco control, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, ban all types of advertising, so, you know, increase the tax, and create a 100% smoke-free environments, and also promote the cessation through the primary healthcare services. So the, uh, uh, these interventions uh, uh, are being implemented in many cities in Asia Pacific. We hope the, the cities alliance will make a difference uh, in saving lives uh, uh, due to the tobacco-related uh, disease. Uh, the commitment here are also why we need the political commitments. So uh, in other side, the, the tobacco industry, their, the, uh, their interest is to make a profit all the time. The industry, they don't care uh, about the, the disease, about the death, so they make the profit you know, by selling the, the, the deadly product. So the, once we have the uh, local and national commitments, especially from the government side, uh, it would help to, to prevent the industry interference uh, in policy developments and policy the, the implementation. So we need the action, the, those action where we need, we need, especially at the, at the, at the, uh, at the sub-national level. So that would, uh, that would uh, really uh, uh, indicate uh, the, the effective uh, in the ways to uh, prevent or manage the the uh, the, uh, the cancer uh, and also the uh, other NCD uh, related disease. Uh, one other thing I would like to say, uh, add here is uh, uh, stakeholders engagement. It's not uh, the uh, tobacco control or any public health program is not only the mandate of the governments or the, any, any particular organization. Here we need uh, really uh, the multi-sectoral co uh, coordinations, collaborations among different the, the stakeholders, including the civil societies, uh, the professional organization, the, the, the media, the, the, the partners, and as well as the uh, uh, you know, the, the people living with the different, the NCDs. 
and the uh, the youth uh, the, uh, is a is a very uh, you know the critical the uh, the stakeholder so we need to enhance the uh, the engagement of the youth leaders in in uh, in ncd control especially on cancer control and prevention program and also to uh, control the tobacco use so there are the many strategies uh, so i think the uh, what we need now is we need action on the ground without action uh, so you know the uh, we cannot make it any difference so over to you thank you very much dr bam and uh, we are actually waiting for thu uh, belon from world cancer day campaign manager i do not know for some reason perhaps she is not there so as soon as she comes in we will take her in uh, meanwhile before we open the question and answer session can we please have one short and crisp take home message from each of our panelists one take home message to reduce deaths due to cancers by one by uh, as envisaged in the uh, sustainable development goals nathya would uh, would you like to begin okay thank you i cannot uh, take one take home message with uh, to prevent lung cancer by do not smoke because is um, if you are not if you are non smoker don't start and if you are smoker quit smoker is quit smoking is the best yes okay puja yeah i may like to say that to have a health seeking behavior stay healthy exercise have be conscious of what uh, you are eating be aware of your own breast and your whole body and uh, don't hesitate to reach to a doctor if any problem is there so i think we have to be more proactive that's the only message uh, dr bam uh, yeah, uh i i would say here is the let's uh, work together to you know the to uh, for effective tobacco control especially let's uh, advocate the national the governments and sub national governments to make a strong tobacco control a uh, legislation and uh, make sure that those legislations are well implemented uh, 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 on the ground okay uh, thank you uh, at this juncture uh, i would like to share with all of you a personal tragedy uh, only yesterday i lost a close relative to cancer and the most tragic part was that we could do little to alleviate his sufferings Uh, and his physical agony during the last months in his fight against the disease while it is very important to deal with modifiable risk factors to prevent cancer we cannot ignore palliative care or so do i believe but barring a few exceptions palliative care seems to be very low on the priority list of medical practitioners particularly in a country like india but one such exception is dr anwar hussain director institute Fortunate to have him with us today here. I invite Dr. Ranbir to share his thoughts on this important but often neglected aspect of cancer care and control. Over to you, Dr. Ranbir. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. I hope you can see my video also. Uh, I can't see your. We cannot see your video. I cannot oh. see it. Oh, I have unmuted. Uh, let me see once again. So video. Um, video. My antivirus is blocking. I know that. Okay. So not connected to this though, but one antivirus was blocking the camera. Oh, but 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 <laughs> voice is very clear. Voice okay. is very clear. Yes. Okay. I'll, 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 yeah, I'll start talking. I am uh, Dr. Yes. Anwar. Uh, I am the present director of the Institute of Palliative Medicine, which is a WHO collaborating uh, center. Uh, it's situated in Calicut Medical College in Kerala, India. Uh, Kerala, of course, the popular model of Kerala in palliative care is uh, very popular uh, in the palliative fraternity around the world. Uh, I find uh, the reason behind. Uh, <clears throat> the ignorance of palliative care uh, uh, as you said in the last phases of human life is uh, a very big issue now because 
anyway, we all have to die. Whatever preventive measures we take, whatever uh, precautions we make, uh, we all we have to die one day. So um, if, if you ask anyone how the way you want to die, if it is suddenly or gradually, the answer will be 99% of the people want to die suddenly. But unfortunately, only 10% of the people die suddenly and 90% of the people have a very gradual end of life. That means uh, we have a very tough phase of life towards the end of our life. Recently, a UK-based uh, company stated the quality of death uh, in 80 countries. Hope you can he all hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear you very clearly. Okay. Okay. And uh, recently, a uh, UK-based uh, company studied the quality of death, and India was 67th among 80 countries. That means only 13 countries die miserably than us. However well we live, however the quality of life we make in our life, our last days, if we become <coughs> dependent, if we are uh, bed-bound, bedridden, <coughs> our quality of life suffers a lot, and especially the quality of death in the end. The reason behind all this is because we, at the end of the life as a human being, we have not only the physical problems, we have all sorts of problems, uh, including the social uh, aloofness, loss of job, uh, financial problems, spiritual problems, most importantly, spiritual problems. So all these problems come in this fact end of life and medical fraternity, medical profession alone cannot solve these problems. Because you can only, as, as professionals, we can only take care of the physical and to some extent the mental part of the uh, patient. But the huge amount of suffering, maybe the 70 to 80 percent of the suffering in the, on the other side of uh, 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 the scheme, that is uh, social, economic, spiritual, and financial things. So uh, that is where the palliative care is very important, I believe, because that is why Kerala becomes so popular and successful in palliative care, because we realize that the medical fraternity can only, uh, like in, in improving the quality of life, the medical profession can only uh, uh, like 20% uh, role there, the other 80% role to improve the quality of life in our own lives, including you and me, lies in the hands of the society, family, friends, government, et cetera. So we realized in Kerala about 27 years back in 1993 that the community-based palliative care system is a system we should work in the community so that all people from all walks of life should address the problems of a dying person or a patient in his last days. So we came together, we have uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, even auto rickshaw drivers. We have uh, a police station running palliative care in Kerala. We have colleges, arts colleges running palliative care. And so the, uh, the realization that the end of life care problem is not only a, a, a medical thing, that realization was the reason behind the success of palliative care in Kerala. In India, according to recent statistics, more than 95% of the palliative care in India, it happens in Kerala. And uh, from the deserving people who needs palliative care, that is this long-term bedridden patients or the non-curable patients who are, as you said, diagnosed as non-curable, have 75% of the patient in Kerala gets palliative care in one way or another but the percentage as a total in India is less than 3%, which is very alarming. And you can see the differences of magnitude uh, of palliative care in Kerala and across India. So uh, the one success secret I believe is involvement of the community as part of it, because this is a social problem more than an, a medical problem. Of course, it has the medical component, but the social aspect of the problem is more in your life, in my life, when we need, when we near our end. So what happened in Kerala was all people from all walks of life together came to solve the problem. So you have more than 4,000 student volunteers who studies in arts and science colleges working us in the patient care. We are one of the leading palliative care centers in the world. As I said, we, are, we were the first WHO collaborating center in the developing countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we got this mandate because of uh, this establishing this community-based palliative care across uh, Kerala. And we are spreading this message of community-based palliative care in other parts of India. We are doing now in Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, and different parts of India. It is very difficult to replicate this model because of the socio-cultural uh, factors, but we are customizing it and uh, changing it according to the social scenarios of where we work. And uh, that is the only solution I think we can have, as you said, it is a very important phase of every human life. 
because once you are bedridden, once you are dependent, once your privacy is lost, once your degrees are no more in use, that phase becomes very important where you need help from outside. And medical profession's role is limited there. So as a team, as a community, as a society, you have to help those patients, those people who are in the end of life. Hope uh, the message is clear. Any doubts or clarification, I can. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anwar Hussain, and wish uh, the rest of India could follow Kerala's model. Kerala's, uh, Kerala's uh, health uh, uh, indices and social indices are much higher than the uh, rest of the rest of India, and we wish we had more people and more institutes like yours in India. That is very important. Uh, very, very important for what you said. And uh, we finally have with us uh, Thu Khuk Bilon, the World Cancer Day Campaign Manager uh, at the Union for International Cancer Control. Welcome Thu. And could you please share with us this year's uh, important messages around World Cancer Day? We've been waiting impatiently for you. Over to you Thu. Yes, we cannot hear you too. Please unmute yourself. Okay, I think there is some internet problem at her end. Uh, so um, we would like to begin the question and answer session. And we now invite the participants for their comments and questions. You can type in your questions and comment in the chat box, which you must be seeing on your screen. And if you wish to speak, please write in the chat box that you wish to speak, unmute yourself and ask your question and just introduce yourself also. And Hi, once the question is answered. Now. Okay, j j yes, too. okay. Because uh, <laughs> I had moved on. Okay, we are back. Uh, so sorry, I will continue once. Thu gives uh, her, uh, shares her thoughts. Yes, Thu. Uh, my apologies, Shobha, my apologies to everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting myself and UICC to present on World Cancer Day. Um, so hello to everyone for, from Geneva and also thank you to the, our co-hosts as well uh, for putting on this webinar. Um, in, in honor of World Cancer Day. So we're over uh, just over a week to World Cancer Day. I'd love to share my screen if that's possible. I, I hope uh, we'll yes. have the opportunity to share the screen, but I'll, I'll continue and we, we can certainly uh, see if that's possible. Uh, what, well, you know, World Cancer Day is uh, happening on the Tuesday, uh, 4th of February, as many of you may already know and the intention of UICC, the Union for International Cancer Control, is to, to raise awareness, to improve education and really catalyze action um, around this global day um, at, at every level. Thu, Thu, can I interrupt please? Thu, can I interrupt for a moment? Can you please share your screen? Can, can you share your screen? You must I, be having I'm that option of sharing your screen. Sharing yes, I'm getting a, a message saying I cannot share while another participant is sharing. While oh, another now. participant. There we go. Perfect. Yes. yes, we can see. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. So hopefully you see my screen now. Excellent. Yes. So, yes. So uh, I was uh, really just covering what our objectives and our aims and our mission with World Cancer Day is. Uh, World Cancer Day is led by the UICC and it's really an opportunity for us to gather um, voices around the world um, to speak um, on cancer on one day through, um, within the global international health calendar. So we know that by raising awareness, this really does give us the opportunity to take part in positive and uh, productive dialogue around some of the most important issues in cancer, <clears throat> particularly um, for initiatives like the, the webinar that we're having today and having conversations that hopefully will lead to increased awareness, increased um, education and hopefully action around cancer. 
So in talking about cancer, what we are aiming to do is uh, elevate uh, the issue at um, within the media, within uh, the political agenda, but also at a real community level in terms of destigmatizing the issues, reducing fears around cancer, demystifying some of the misconceptions around cancer, because a lot of these things in terms of myths and misconceptions and misinformation that we're seeing a lot of uh, around cancer is really preventing um, health seeking behavior. So we're hoping that with World Cancer Day, we're able to in increase that, not just the volume, but the, the, the type of productive conversations we wanna have around um, cancer. And I think, you know, when we're improving our awareness levels and we're improving our knowledge and understanding of the disease, uh, we're able to prevent it by understanding uh, the early uh, signs and symptoms of cancer and hopefully, and ultimately the, the end goal is to save valuable lives. <clears throat> So it's a, a, a very special year for us, World Cancer Day 2020. It marks the, the 20th anniversary since it was first created at the turn of the millennium. And it was written into the Charter of Paris Against Cancer. Um, and 2020 really is a celebration of the progress that, and achievements that have been made over the past two decades, but it's also an opportunity for us to identify, reflect on, and see what are the progress gaps and where we need further accelerated action. And we think that more than ever, World Cancer Day plays an important and valuable part in drawing global attention, in uniting the voices around cancer and really bringing cancer into sharp focus to improve the sort of the public and the political literacy around the disease. So we know that cancer cases and uh, potentially some of the speakers already have mentioned that cancer cases and cancer deaths will continue to rise without concerted action. So we recognize that even though the past two decades there has a lot been um, achieved, uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. So we've seen over the past few years with World Cancer Day, a leading global international awareness day that we've been able to impact um, in terms of number and see it uh, as a catalyst for action. So the theme for 2020 continues, um, uh, began in 2019 and will continue again in 2020. And the theme is, I am and I will. And it's really the theme is all about you and your actions re to reduce the impact of cancer. And that's what we've been talking about is how our actions can make lasting positive um, impact. And it's a really powerful reminder that the things that we do and the actions that we take and the commitment to act, um, everybody has a role to play and everybody has an opportunity and a responsibility to act as well. So last year in 2019, it was the start of the I Am and I Will theme. We had hundreds, if not thousands of supporters share their own I Am and I Will messages. And I would certainly encourage you who are listening and participating in this webinar today to also reflect on your own I Am and I Will message and answer the two questions we're asking all of our supporters, which is who are you and what will you do on World Cancer Day? So I encourage you to share your message of commitment. So we're, as I mentioned, just over a week to go until World Cancer Day. So I really want to run you through what to expect on the day itself. We have hundreds and hundreds of activities taking place all over the world. This past year, we had over 900 activities that took place in 127 countries. And we imagine that's going to be even more than that in our 20th year. Um, for example, in India, the uh, first cancer summit are gathering leaders and decision makers in New Delhi to talk and discuss cancer and health. Uh, the European Commission will be kicking off their EU cancer plan 
on 4th of February, so there will be some uh, a lot of high level discussions happening on World Cancer Day, but there are also many, many other activities happening around the world taking place, whether it's fundraisers, whether it's conferences, workshops, press conferences, um, uh, and awareness raising activities, free cancer screenings happening all around the world. So I encourage you to go onto our website, worldcancerday.org and go onto our map. And there you'll see all of the activities that are being registered on the World Cancer Day website so that you'll see the breadth and depth of some of the activities and efforts that are being made uh, on the day itself and in around the day as well. We'll also, for the first time, and here's a slide here, if you have access to your screen, some of the activities that took place in 2019. Students are getting involved, journalists, and I see a lot of journalists already uh, participating on this webinar, getting involved in spreading the message. Government leaders, uh, scientists, and the academic community, as well as um, civil society organizations taking part in World Cancer Day. We'll also be uh, seeing the World Cancer Day stretching out into the evening as well. We'll have landmarks illuminated um, across the world in different cities, um, marking and supporting World Cancer Day. So you'll see landmarks, buildings, bridges, towers being lit up in orange and blue in various cities around the world. So. Uh, at current count, we have over 50 landmarks and 30 cities being involved on the day. So if you've been following us also on social media, you would have seen some uh, prominent leaders as well um, who have been answering one question. And that question is, what is the bravest thing that we can do about cancer? We'll be sharing more of these videos throughout uh, the days leading up to World Cancer Day. So I encourage you all to reflect on this question. What is the bravest thing we can do about cancer? Share that in a video message and post it on to social media. We have leaders around their world, be they political community, uh, government and corporate leaders answering the exact same question. And we wanna hear your thoughts on what's the bravest thing we can do about cancer. We'll also be broadcasting live on Facebook on the World Cancer Day okay. Facebook page. Uh, thank you too. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Shoba. Yes, yes, hello. Yes, we can hear you, yes. Yes. Uh, shall I continue? Yeah, you can. Uh, you can. Yes, of course. Yeah. Please do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the, we'll be broadcasting live on Facebook um, and we'll be really featuring some of our members and our supporters and they'll be sharing what they will be doing to mark World Cancer Day on the 4th of February. So this broadcast, tune in to facebook.com forward slash World Cancer Day. That'll be starting from 6 a.m. Central European time on 4th of February. It really gives us a chance to see in real time what supporters are doing around the world. And very, very lastly, I want to, um, to give you a bit of an insight and a bit of a preview into the global press story. Um, this will be sent out to, uh, to the media on the 30th of January, what I can actually share is that uh, the, we will be sharing and releasing a report um, written by the UICC um, and we've led a survey, it's the International Public Opinion Survey on cancer and this report will be released uh, publicly on the 4th of February but media do have access to it um, on the 30th of January. So if there are any editors and journalists and media um, who are interested and who are on this call and would like advanced access, we'll make sure to add you to that. So if you can email us, uh, we'll make sure that you are on that media distribution list. So we, the, the report will, uh, will include findings of the survey and we really were curious to understand what people were thinking, what they were feeling, what they believe, what their views, their attitudes, their opinions they hold on cancer. So really revealing findings, really interesting insights, and we can't wait to share them with you and the rest of the world on World Cancer Day. 
Uh, we believe it's important to understand these attitudes, their concerns, their behaviors, and that's really going to help us move forward in the same direction and for renewed action. So yeah, I'll, I'll conclude it there and I'll end it there. I, I know that's been a lot of information covered in a short period of time, but you know, we invite you all uh, to join us on World Cancer Day on Tuesday, the 4th of February. It's a day where we're bringing everybody together to increase understanding, to reduce our fears and really change our behaviors and attitudes around cancer. Thank you very much. And I'll pass it back to you now, Shoba. Thank you very much too. And um, we have already set the ball rolling. Uh, now uh, we open the open uh, our open session. We begin our open session with a comment from Kalpana Acharya, who is president of Health Journalist Forum Nepal. Uh, Kalpana, we would like to hear from you. Uh, can you hear me, Kalpana? She, she has a special comment to make. Hello, Kalpana, are you there? Uh, maybe she's having some internet issues, but so uh, I will just read out her comment. Uh, she had sent it in writing also in, in I'm dealing with a, uh, Kalpana says that with changing lifestyles, there has been a significant rise in the number of cancer patients in Nepal too. And in Nepal, about 30,000 new cases of cancer are diagnosed every year. And among them, only 10,000 patients reach the hospital for treatment. So to make aware the remaining 20,000 patients to go to the hospital to seek treatment, their, each one's role is very important. Here, media can play a very constructive role for society. It's a powerful tool of communication and presents the real uh, face and real uh, issues of society. So media can be mo mobilized for cancer awareness too. Let us join hands and beat NCDs like cancer together. Uh, we also have with us here in the audience today, Dr. Rajin Prasad, who's a very noted lung health specialist uh, from India. Uh, uh, and Dr. Rajin Prasad, if you are hearing me, then could you please share your thoughts on how uh, tuberculosis and lung cancer symptoms mimic each other and uh, what is the way out? Dr. Rajin Prasad. Meanwhile, we have lot many questions pouring in. Lot of questions have come up already. Uh, while we wait for Dr. Rajin Prasad to get online, uh, uh, we have uh, a question from uh, Pooja Avasti, senior journalist from India. Uh, she wants to gain some clarity on cancers in children. And at what young age do they start and what are some specific uh, cancers and any specific advances made for cancer treatment in children. Uh, would uh, Pooja and Natya like to answer that? Hello. Hello. Uh, sure, madam. Yes. Yes. In children, a lot of cancers do happen, like thyroid cancers, leukemias, lymphomas, then uh, kidney, renal cell tumors, Wilms tumors. So children do suffer from cancers. Majority times it is genetic, though we don't do the genetic tests because of cost and availability and facilities. Though sometimes it's that. And uh, there are a lot of like thalassemias and a lot of uh, societies are there to support children who are dealing with cancers. Government, a lot of uh, facilities are there to make the whole treatment free for those children. So pediatric oncology has become a separate speciality which deals with the cancers in children. So they are managed differently than adults and there are a lot of societies available to help them. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nathya, would you like to add something to that? Dr. Nathya? 
Okay, we have uh, another question from Rita Vidya Dana, who is a senior journalist and uh, uh, was uh, from uh, Indonesia. She was formerly with Jakarta Post and is now country director for Consortium for Press Freedom. Uh, Rita says, uh, rather, she is. Uh, uh, she's affected by this. Uh, she's very much affected that uh, Indonesia's in Indonesia, 75, 65% uh, cancer patients seek treatment in late stage because they are unaware of the sy symptoms. Misinformation on symptoms and treatments have flooded the internet and social media, encouraging them to choose various uh, so-called alternative treatments for cancer-related illnesses, like using herbal medicine. Uh, instead of uh, uh, instead of going to a hospital, how dangerous is it, and the, what should be improved in any nation's cancer treatment and cancer control programs? Uh, Pooja, would you like to say something for that? Yes, it is extremely dangerous to spread uh, misinformation, and they say half information is more dangerous than full information, or okay. inadequate information is more dangerous than adequate. So I think government should take steps that uh, if they find anything which is not right on internet, that should be site should be blocked, or that information should be not displayed to public. And from government side, we should put efforts to uh, pass it on the more the right informations door to door. I think services and uh, that may help them that way. And to create awareness to come early is very important. Like in Mumbai, Maharashtra, they have done very good. And behind the buses, autos, all the public transport vehicles, they have written, if you come early, your cancer is curable in early stage. Please come early to doctor. So all those informations they have put in a lot of public places. So I think we have to reach to them to have all these awareness. And we can do by simple means to create these awareness. But we have to make those effective and simple steps to create those awarenesses. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Titilayo Adogoke, who's a nurse from Nigeria. And Titilayo says, what are some health prevention or safety or hygiene practices that can be followed to prevent cancer in industrial organizations? Would any panelists like to say something on that? I think Nathya or Pooja. Yes, especially if you have some factory or some uh, area where you are exposed to more cancers. Yes. One is that uh, we have to have a radiation measurement done for that areas mm -hmm. where the toxins are being disposed. That has to be checked. It should not be like in the river. We are disposing the waste material, which is contaminating the water and same water we are drinking. So like that or in the field somewhere we are exposing like here in radiation oncology department, they have got certain meters which they take, checks everybody's radiation exposure every month. So if somebody's exposure is higher, then they are stopped for a while and that is checked why it is happening. So preventive measures in the form of health seeking behavior may be to avoid carbohydrate rich diet. That helps a lot have more protein rich and fat diet to drink a lot of water, warm water helps a lot and uh, to exercise regularly, to ensure that whatever contaminants are around us or any pollutants are there to stay away from it or and to avoid its spillage or uh, contamination more in societies. Okay. Uh, we, we are we have already, yes, hello? Shubha, it's Twee yes. um, from Mokhnet today from UICC. Yes, um, yes, yes. yes. There'll be, um, I think, a few other questions that we would be interested in answering as well. And I do have yes. my, yes. our global advocacy manager, Rosie Tasker, who's also yes. um, able to answer some of the questions posed by the participants. Yes, sure. Yes, yes sure. Welcome, Rosie. Uh, sure, sure. Hi, thank you so much. And good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes. I think kind of Picking up on uh, Dr. Ramakant's um, point, there are some also some really important things that anyone in any work environment can do, particularly if you're uh, running a work environment, there are some things that you can do to help reduce people's cancer risk. I mean, I think the first one amongst them is of course, making sure that you have smoke-free working spaces so people aren't exposed to tobacco smoke. 
I think, as she was saying, things like fostering healthy eating, whether that be through canteens or making sure that people have spaces mm. to eat and uh, spaces to exercise as well. And I think the last one and a small one that people can do is actually making time and space for people to attend regular cancer screening. Um, so actually giving those employees the opportunity to go and participate in these screening uh, programs, but also encouraging them to do so. Um, and for anyone who's interested, there's a lot of really great sort of toolkits for organizations who are interested in creating a more positive and sort of uh, positive prevention environment for cancer online. Uh, UICC co-produced one with Bupa. I know Milan has a really fantastic kit as well for anyone who's in a working environment and working with a cancer patient currently. And they've got some excellent advice for, for different working environments there as well. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from Boril, uh, Beryl Osindo from Kenya. She's a CNS correspondent from there. Uh, she wants uh, the panel, uh, panelists to address the issue of disability and cancer that uh, with advancing age people are those people who are physically challenged and face difficulty in moving uh, uh, what can be done that uh, to prevent that a sedentary lifestyle uh, increases cancer risk for the physically challenged and uh, uh, old people of um, older age who are immobile and not as mobile as the others. Uh, can any one of the panelists please respond to that? Yeah, I think if you are physically challenged, still we can be mobile wherever we are. Like if we cannot move our legs, we can move our hands, chest, body, upper part. So we can exercise at whatever place we are. So that way we can do certain activities in spite of being this. And there are a lot of water exercises available in the swimming pools, which are especially for uh, physically challenged people that also helps. So we have a lot of options, though they are limited and we have to explore, but we can remain active in spite of having physical challenges. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm glad that you mentioned the uh, hydro therapy and exercises in water because i think that is i do not know uh, that is an unexplored area or, or underexplored area perhaps in the indian context but that is a very important point which you have uh, mentioned there uh, rashmika majumdar from reach organization wants to know what role can civil society organizations play towards the reduction of untimely deaths due to cancer uh, rosie would you like to say something to that Okay. Thanks, Shoba. Yes, I would. That is an excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, I think one of the, the key things that civil society organisations can do is advocacy. Um, now, chatting to UICC members around the world, that can sometimes seem a little intimidating um, to begin with, but advocacy is something we all do day to day. And I think it's really, really important for civil society organizations who are engaging with patients, engaging with their families, engaging with survivors to actually keep raising the importance of cancer within their national contexts. I think one of the most important things we have are the, the survivors of cancer in terms of helping to make the case with individuals to make change their own behaviors, but also with governments to actually start investing in the health systems we need to help reduce cancer through prevention measures, but also ensure timely um, and accurate and affordable and quality care um, that we know that cancer patients are going to need in the future. I think another okay. thing that okay. a you. lot of society uh, organizations are doing yeah. is actually providing the care as well. So don't, don't underestimate that. They're both such critically important roles. Sure, yes, but I'll right. also add as well in terms of what yes. journalists yes. can do to, to yes. reduce uh, right deaths mm. due to cancer and and this was raised early on uh, by one of the participants in in terms of the yes. misinformation that has been spread uh, journalists mm. do have the opportunity to work with organizations work with civil society around the world um, to help inform to educate to raise awareness to have accurate reporting of the science of the data um, you know journalists do have the opportunity to use their platform 
platforms to reduce some of the myths and stigma and cultural taboos around cancer, which we've seen prevents a lot of people from uh, seeking help and seeking uh, health services. So journalists with their platforms are able to, through um, through working with civil society, help us reduce some of that misinformation around cancers and the cancer cures, for example, and treatments, and really continue to keep a cancer on the editorial agenda so that, you know, in the public con it's in the public conscience and it provides the pressure to governments also to act as well. So a lot of uh, a really important and pivotal role that journalists can play. Okay, well, thank you very much. And very well said indeed, yes. All of us can play a big role. Uh, I'm once again uh, wondering if Dr. Rajin Prasad is there and if he has unmuted himself, uh, if he could uh, uh, give his valuable cont contribution to this webinar. Dr. Rajin Prasad, he's a noted lung health specialist from India. Okay, maybe, maybe some internet problem at his end. We have already sh overshot the time by over uh, by nearly 20 minutes. So it is better that we now come to the close of the webinar. My sincere thanks to all our panelists for a very enriching discussion. We are grateful for, to the participants for their engagement with the webinar. And last but not the least, special thanks to our guest moderator, Ashok Ramsarup. The webinar was streamed live on CNS Facebook page. And as always, the link to the webinar recording and podcast will be shared with all the participants and will soon be available in public domain. This webinar was co-hosted by APCAT, Asia Pacific Cities Alliance for Tobacco Control and NCDs Prevention, and by APCAT Media Network, the Asia Pacific Media Network to NPB and Tobacco and Prevent NCDs and Health Journalists Forum Nepal with Citizen News Service. Thanks and have a restful day. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.